Lord, I want to be near you. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to be in your intimate mercy. Lord, I want to be like you. No one can be Are you ready for the word? Amen, amen. Tonight we are in our eighth lesson in the series concerning the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk to you tonight about drinking, drinking in the Holy Spirit. And this is something that Jesus brought up. And so I invite your attention to John's Gospel, chapter 37, John 7, 37. This was the Feast of Tabernacles, and Jesus had sent the disciples on into Jerusalem, and he said he would stay back because there were too many people trying to find him and hurt him and kill him and all that kind of good stuff. But what he did, he went to Jerusalem after, a little bit later, undercover, so to speak, and he slipped into the temple and lo and behold, started teaching, and in a little while, they realized Jesus has shown up. Sometimes I think Jesus sends us on ahead. And then he shows up right in the middle of what's going on. Don't be surprised. You're never alone, okay? He's always somewhere around, okay? He may look like he's hiding, but I promise you he's going to show up. He'll show up. As I was preaching Sunday, he'll show up on time, all right? And so, uh, in the conversation and teaching, what have you, he finally leaves the temple and goes outside to watch the priest going down to the pool of Shalom to, with the chalice to get the water and take it back and pour it on the altar. And he was just overwhelmed with the lack of understanding, for another expression, I guess, that, that people, people just didn't understand what was going on. They were going through the rituals. We go to church. Do we know why we go to church? Apparently we don't because we're still struggling. <clears throat> we're st <clears throat> we're st <clears throat> Bad, yes. Hallelujah. We can overcome. I got a cough drop right here. In case anybody thinks I need a cough drop, I've got them. I got a pocket full of them. They do me a lot of good in my pocket, right? <laughs> Have you ever tried to talk with a piece of candy in your mouth? You're so levitating all over the place, you know. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> So if I get there, I'll have to have, do it, I'll do it, but I think I'm going to be okay. But the thing was, Jesus was frustrated over the fact that people didn't understand what was going on. And we see that today because for the last coming out of COVID and everything for the last couple of years, people are not getting back in church. They have decided, hey, I can, I can watch the pastor on television and stay in my pajamas and eat my Wheaties and just kind of have a nice day and relax and everything. Folk, I want you to understand that Paul goes on and tells us this. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, especially as you get close to the end before the coming of the Lord, if there ever was a time for people to be in church, now is the time. You go to church not to hear the preacher. That's you right. go to church for fellowship. Yes. Fellowship with one another, yes, but fellowship with God. And your fellowship with God involves your praise, your worship, your thanksgiving, your giving, your celebration, everything that you're doing. And so what happens is this, as you are ministering, you are growing. Love, joy, and peace is fruit. It's not the gift of the Spirit, it's fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. And we always talk about the nine fruits of the Spirit. No, there's only one, and that's love. The fruit, is, read your Bible, it says fruit. It doesn't say fruits. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love. And you read the translation of that, and you'll find love produces peace. And peace, they give you joy. And if you've got love, joy, and peace, you learn how to be patient. You understand what I'm saying? 
And so this is a growing process. And so when we get together, we, we know everything. You know, you can't tell us anything. We know it all, right? Well, we've got new people coming in that don't know it all. And they need you, not me, they need you to teach them. So right now, you should be, we just finished our discipleship class, our mentoring class. You should be mentoring somebody right now. The average person, solid Christian, can mentor five people at one time. Very effectively, three at one time. Very effectively, three at one time. And so what I had you to do when we were doing the class on mentoring, I told you to write down the three people that you were mentoring. And some of you did, and some of you kept me posted on what's going on. But I challenge you again tonight, if you are not mentoring, that means you're pouring yourself into an individual. If you're not mentoring three people right now, you need to go home and say, God, give me the list. Because those people are around you already, and they're asking questions. And you've got the answer. You say, well, I don't know if I've got the answer or not. You know what? When I didn't have the answer, I'd say, I can look it up. There you go. I can find the answer. I'll get back to you on that. I was in teaching a class over at Teen Challenge yesterday morning, and just before I got into the lesson, one of the students said, I have a question for you. And they asked me a question I have never been asked before in my entire life. A very good question. Is speaking in tongues a conscious effort? Is the baptism in the Holy Ghost, with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues, is that a conscious effort? And the answer is both yes and no. Yes, in the sense that you've got to open your mouth. Yes, in the sense that you have to yield. Yes, in the sense that you have to present your body, a temple holy unto the Lord, we'll mention again in a moment. But at the same time, know in this respect, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven like a rushing mighty wind and filled all the house where they were sitting. Tongues of fire appeared over them. The fire glory came down upon them. You shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. That happened on the day of Pentecost. And it was not a conscious effort on their part. Their action was they were doing what they were told. Terry, Mary, work with, become with, become one with, get in a spirit of unity. And so they, for 10 days they had been in the upper room in one accord. So yes and no answers the question. So here lately I've been, of course, focusing on the Holy Spirit. And the Lord kind of shut me up into my man cave and said, Look, I want you to spend time with me. I want you to talk to me. I'm not trying to be spiritual or super spiritual when I tell you this. But what I'm telling you is it's changing me. It's changing me in several ways. And one of the things is for several nights for the last couple of weeks, I have wake, awakened myself speaking in tongues. To my knowledge, I have never done that until now, not wake up in the middle of the night speaking in tongues. And I'm doing that now. And this morning, I started speaking in tongues, and I stopped, and I thought, that felt pretty good. And I just went back into tongues again, and I just spent some time with the Lord, you know. And it gave me a spirit of refreshing. And so I want to tell you something. When you pray in the Spirit, it is a season of refreshing. And I told you all of that to tell you this, that Jesus is looking at the rituals and the formalities that they were going through during the Feast of Tabernacles. They've had a week of celebration, uh, and for the most part, they're going through religious motion. And so Jesus, in his zeal, uh, uh, maybe exasperation, he stands up. In verse 37, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now, are you thirsting for what? Hello? What are you thirsty for? Yes. You have a scripture in the Psalms that says, As the deer pants for the waters, so my soul cries out for thee. 
I had no clue what that verse meant. I was on a camp out with the boys in the church there at Brownville, Pensacola. And this is one of our favorite campsites, mainly because there was a river that ran into the bay, the Gulf. So you had fresh water, salt water, you had a beach, you had the wood, the forest. It was on this side, it was really a state park. The other side was private property. But the owner of that private property didn't mind us hiking, and as long as we didn't tear up anything, he didn't mind us being there. And so we were used to having that entire area to ourselves. We go up to camp this one particular time, and there is a fence that had been installed on that side of the river. The owner had sold it, and the new owner didn't want anybody trespassing on his land from the state park. And as I stood there on the bank of the river looking over to the fenced area, I saw some deer crying. Now, I never heard a deer cry. And I turned to one of my commanders and I said, I've never heard a deer do that. He said, they're crying because they can't get to the water. The fence, they're thirsty, they want to drink. They can't get to the water. The fence is keeping them away. As the deer cries, pants for the water, my soul cries out to thee. Is there a fence between you and what you want to accomplish spiritually? Are you ready to move up? And, there, and somebody has put a fence in the way, an attitude, or I can't, you know, I could name several things. I don't know what that fence might be in some people's lives. Sometimes it's been, being too busy. I'm busy, 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 busy. That can be a fence. And you find yourself spiritually dry. And then the real issue in this scripture, reading it again with me, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. The door is open. Let him come to me and drink. And to this day, I have yet to find a satisfactory answer to this question. How do you drink in the Holy Spirit? And so our discussion tonight is drinking in the Holy Spirit. And so verse 37 again, on that last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart, innermost being, will flow rivers of living waters. Now, I have two things going on here all of a sudden in two verses. One, I'm supposed to come to him and drink, and I'm not sure how I'm going to how I'll do that. And the other one is, out of my innermost being are flowing not one, but rivers of plural rivers of living water. So I'm drinking in and there's something flowing out. I'm drinking in, you know, we have a little course we sing which sometimes bothers me. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. It's a nice little course. But you know what? I never settle for a cup of coffee. I settle for cups of coffee. Refills. I keep the pot going all the time. And so here is a question here of how do you drink in the Holy Spirit of God and where are these rivers coming from? And is there a connection between what I'm drinking in and what's flowing out of me? And without any further ado, I can tell you there's a big connection between what's flowing out of me based on what's been going into me. So, have you been drinking lately, and whose fountain are you drinking at, okay? Whose well have you been drinking at? What bar have you, never mind, you understand what I'm saying, okay? All right. So, go with me again, verse 39. But this he spoke concerning the Holy Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Therefore, many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, Truly this is the prophet. 
And when they say the prophet, they're talking about Messiah, okay? I don't know what convinced them just from that one saying. Was it how he said it? Was it the way it's read here? I don't know. Let's see what we can find out. So look at your introduction and your outline, and then we'll go to the book of Acts. Introduction, seeking God is always a wonderful and refreshing time. And that's what was happening to me this morning about 5.30, maybe a little earlier than that. I wake myself up praying in the Spirit. And I stopped, and I thought, I'll get up. And I thought, no, that feels too good. And so I just settled back down, and I just kept praying in the Spirit. And it became refreshing. Weariness began to get out of my mind and out of my body. And after a little while, I'm beginning to feel like I can take on the devil. I can take on Thursday. I can take on Friday. I can take on anything. You know what I mean? So I want you to ask yourself this question. Have you come to that place with your prayer language that when you're praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit, that you're actually sensing that refreshing? I want you to get to the point where it is a refreshing. Some people seem to me, seems to me, when they're praying in the Spirit, that they're agonizing and working real hard. I've seen people break a sweat praying in tongues, okay? I can understand if you're interceding and that's what you're supposed to be doing. I'm not going to question that. But interceding means to run interference. And I want to tell you, I've got to be nice, but I want to make my point, okay? Can I be nice and make a tough point? If I'm sweating bullets praying in the Spirit, am I putting a lot of my flesh into it instead of relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to get the job done? I think so. That's me. I don't want to, if, you, if it works for you, go for it. But I believe with all of my heart, you shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And in my name, in my character, you cast out devils, bind up the brokenhearted, set people free, open blind eyes, raise the dead. Uh, there's no limit to what you can do if you know who you are and what you have. How many of you know you are a joint heir with Jesus Christ? How many of you know that's worth more than being a citizen of the United States? Amen. And the government hasn't given you a whole lot, but I want you to know God's given us everything. Amen. We're the most, as a nation, we're the most powerful nation on the planet in different ways, uh, militarily, financially. I was just reading uh, today as I was doing some studying what the average income for an American was compared to what the average income for the people in Israel is. And I never realized that there are more Jews in Israel in that little small strip of land than there is in the other countries individually. For example, there is a right at 7 million Jews in the Holy Land right now. And when you look at Saudi Arabia down there, it's half that many. And what's so interesting is that the Jews have the highest income of all the Middle East. All the nations of the Middle East, the Jews have the highest income. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say, how many of you are king's kids? Then you have the highest level of income of anybody else serving any other god. It's an attitude, folks. Let's get into this game and win. Amen. How many losers do I have in the house? Not one. How many victorious overcomers, powerful saints of God? Hallelujah. Amen. We are here. We are here. So looking again, seeking God is a refreshing time. We continually seek fellowship with God in all things at all times. The, with the baptism in the Holy Spirit, this fellowship is more productive. With the baptism, it's more productive. People are often surprised after receiving the Holy Spirit as to how easy it was to receive. You don't have to wait for a gift already given. You just say thank you. Hallelujah, that's right. That's right. Again, tarry ye in Jerusalem means marry, union, communion, become one. Amen. Now, point one in our outline Look to the work of the Holy Spirit, not people's experiences, okay? Now, with that said and done, go with me to Acts chapter 1. Look with me, a very familiar passage of Scripture, Acts chapter 1, uh, particularly verse 7 and 8, but I'm going to start in verse 4. 
Jesus had been on the earth for 40 days. He's about to ascend back to heaven. Can you imagine that? I mean, you're standing here talking to somebody, and all of a sudden, you notice their feet's no longer on the ground. And while you were talking to them eyeball to eyeball, all of a sudden you're looking at them, talking to them like this, and they keep going on up, going on. And finally the glory cloud just comes and envelops him, takes him out of their sight, and you've got these two angelic beings standing there. I said, why are you still here looking up? Didn't he give you something to do? <laughs> do it. That's exactly what happened. They were standing there, ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Boy, that was a good service, ooh, ah. Man, I love praise and worship, ooh. Did you hear that sermon? Ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Did you see the building was packed? Ooh, ah, the parking lot was packed. Ooh, ah, ooh, ah. Oh, shut up. What are you doing? Besides ooh and ahhing. I hope I got through it. And so Jesus is getting his group together in verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from peace, Jerusalem, but to tarry, no, but to wait, yes, for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me, I've taught you this. John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. They had no clue what that meant. That's right. They had no clue what it meant. But he did tell them that they were going to receive something. How many of you know that God's promised you something? Amen. Do you have any idea what's coming next? No. When are you going to start thanking him for it? Now! now. Did you get that? And God inhabits the praises of his people. Folk, I want you to understand something. You may have a financial blessing right around the corner. You may have somebody going to give you a million dollars. You may have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, a healing for your body, a piece of furniture, you know, all this kind of good stuff, okay? You don't know what's right around the corner, and so you know that you're God's favorite. You're God's special. You're the chosen one. So what do we do? We just start thanking him for what's on the way. And the glory of God will come down and inhabit your praises. Hallelujah. 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 They asked the Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? See, they're still lacking something in their teaching. That's why they needed the Holy Spirit. This was not about the kingdom of Israel. This is about the kingdom of God. And where is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is within us. They were still looking in the natural. It's only when they receive the Holy Spirit that they begin to see in the Spirit. Okay? And that brings up the gift of the Spirit again. And so in verse 7, Jesus said to them, It's not for you at this time, I'm reading another parallel uh, amplification, It is not for you at this time, or to know the times or seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority. He's kept that to himself. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be seed bearers. Your Bible would say, you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem. You shall be seed bearers. Another commentary also said fruit bearers. Okay? So in one, you got seed, and the other one, you're bearing fruit. So they're both working together. How many of you are sowing seed? Everywhere you go, you're sowing seed. Well, you're also bearing fruit, okay? And people need to be able to come to you and find a delicious apple once in a while. Amen? Amen. 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 Or some figs. You know what figs do? They bring healing. How about a pomegranate tree? I had a... I have got to go to work in my yard. I was trying to be real spiritual. I had a pomegranate tree, a fig tree, and an olive tree. And they're all three dead. So I've got to start all over. I had a, pom a pomegranate tree that had pomegranates on it so big it was breaking the branches. 
I had a fig tree that had so many figs on it, I couldn't keep the neighborhood supplied. I mean, I couldn't get rid of all of them, that kind of thing. I had everybody, I was giving away figs everywhere. They were big figs. The only thing is, I had to fight the squirrels for them. And then, of course, the olive tree, this particular olive tree blooms in December. And you can smell that olive tree for probably a mile away. Beautiful fragrance, beautiful fragrance. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about these are the things that was in the priest's garment. Figs for healing, pomegranates for prosperity and blessing, olives for anointing. How many of you are anointed? The anointing oil that they used in the temple had a fragrance. Smell good. How many of you smell good tonight? Anybody here smell good? You know what I mean? You don't stink, I hope. No stinkers in God's family. Amen. No stinkers. All right. But the whole thing, and you're healed, you're blessed, you're prosperous. Everything is, is in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so once again, I'm reading there. Verse 8, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be seed bearers and fruit bearers, witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And he starts in Jerusalem, he starts in your comfort zone. As long as he's got you in your comfort zone, you're okay. But then he'll take you out of his comfort zone and move you into the next area of your life, Judea. That means, oh my goodness, I've got to get up and talk before the church. You want me to teach a Sunday school class? What are you talking about? Getting you out of your comfort zone. That's not the best part. The best part is he's going to move you from there to Samaria. That's where you start ministering and witnessing to those people you don't like. Anybody have some people in your life you don't like? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> oh, but when they show up, oh, me, what do you, what do you, God, do, that, do I have to do this, Lord? I want you to know that those people get saved. God will change them. So you let God change you too, okay? And then to the uttermost parts of the world simply means this. There's no limit to what you can do if you'll walk through the progression with God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So looking at your outline again with me, under point one, letter A, we must always magnify the word above experiences. Additional experiences to tongue does not mean that a person has more of the Holy Spirit than anyone else. Now, I'll pause on that. When I got the baptism in the Holy Ghost, I spoke in tongues. And that was it. My buddy at that time got the baptism in the Holy Spirit before I did. And when he got the baptism in the Holy Spirit, he jumped up from the altar and he was doing an Indian war dance right in the middle of the floor, just his legs going up and down. He, he was just, I mean, he was just, I thought, the Cherokee Indians are back in town, you know, this kind of thing. And so, a couple of months later, I get the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I thought, am I going to do what, the Cherokee dance, you know? No. I wonder if there was anything wrong with me. <laughs> Hello? No, I, I we had a lady in our church that made the best chicken, fried chicken, southern fried chicken. Oh, dear me. Mm -mm -mm. That woman's chicken. She talked too much. But her chicken was so good I could endure it. <laughs> We'd go to her house and eat fried chicken. Get in the car and be driving away. And I'd look in the rear view mirror and she's standing out in the middle of the road talking to me. She was in her late 80s, almost 90 years old. Physically infirmed in many areas. But when the Holy Spirit fell on a Sunday night service, we're just taking our time with praise and worship and just ministering to the Lord. She would get up and start dancing. 
you would have thought she was a ballerina. So smooth, so beautiful, so graceful. You knew it was God because in the physical she couldn't do that. We've tried to put God in a box and say, now God, this is what you can do and this is what you cannot do. I can assure you he's going to have the last word. But do not base your expectations on somebody else's experience. If this one wants to cry, let him cry. Had a man in the church for many, many years. He couldn't get up and say, I love the Lord without bursting out into tears. And he was always apologizing for being such a crybaby. He'd stand up to give a testimony, and he'd go through a whole box of clean asses before he'd sit down, you know, this kind of thing. And I told him one day, I said, look, brother, that is absolutely okay. But I don't want to disturb or disrupt anything. I said, you're not bothering anybody. If anything, you're blessing them. Then I get this other fellow going over here, and all he can do is, ha, 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 ha. And let me tell you, ha, 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 ha. And he's laughing between every other sentence. And I'm going, oh, you know. I don't judge people, do you? <laughs> Try not to, I heard you. <laughs> but the whole thing is this. Everybody has their own experience. You have yours, I have mine. And that's okay. Because we're each one different. You give one kid a lollipop and he'll act a certain way. And give another kid the same lollipop and get a totally different reaction. Mm -hmm. Same thing is true with the blessings of God. Some people, every time they get a blessing financially, physically, or whatever, they just start crying and praising God. Somebody else gets laughing and celebrating and getting joyful. Others, they start calling everybody in the neighborhood, telling them, I just got blessed, and you've got to listen to them for an hour and a half, tell you about how they got blessed and everything. Hello, it's okay. Don't expect other people's blessing to be your blessing. Just worship the Lord. It'll happen. You often wonder why some women marry certain men. What in the world does she see in him? It doesn't matter as long as she sees it. Hello? Okay. Letter B is very important. The early church had no experiences with seeking and not finding, or coming to receive only to go away empty. What did I just say? I just said, those who seek, find. That's Bible. Did you come tonight expecting a blessing? Did you come tonight expecting fellowship? What did you come tonight? What was your expectation when you headed toward Victory Christian Center on a Wednesday night? What was your expectation? Did you have an expectation? And I asked you this. When you get up in the morning, what would be your expectation? What will you be your expectation for next week? I'm going to tell you something. You know what my expectation is for next week? Signs, wonders, and miracles. I'm believing for power, demonstration of power, demonstration of wonders, and a demonstration of overflow. It's going to be more than I can contain, and I'm just going to splash over on everybody else like Sandra Curry. Amen. Amen. So let us see. Ask yourself, why do you want the baptism in the Holy Spirit? We're not to be self-consumed with wanting God's gift of power for personal reasons rather than fulfilling God's design and purpose for putting us on this planet. On experiences, I like this. The Apostle Paul was on his way to arrest Christians and haul them back to Jerusalem for trial. And on his way, God, Jesus, arrests Paul. The power of God came on him and he hit the, he hit the ground. There was a bright light shining in and a voice spoke from heaven. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? 
Why are you doing this? So the heart was in the right place. His methods were wrong. His reasons were wrong. His heart was right. He said, Lord, who are you? He said, I'm Jesus. Lord, what would you have me do? Didn't take much to change him, did it? You know, if God knocked me down in the middle of the road and a bright light shone around me and a light and a voice started speaking to me, I think I could surrender real quick. When he stood up, he's blind as a bat. He can't see. And so I read over there in Paul's writings. To be saved, you must hear a voice from heaven, stand in a bright light and be blind. No, that was his personal experiences. Had nothing to do with actually being saved. And you read Romans and you find out how to be born again. And so here again, I love testimonies. I do because everybody's got a story. And those stories minister to people. It was just like uh, uh, Mike and uh, Brandon and I was over at Teen Challenge during that storm. And one of our families came in to get out of the storm. And all of a sudden, uh, Brother Greg has me up front to share a word. And I'm thinking, all these scriptures, you know, I'm trying, that won't work, that won't work. Sunday sermon won't work, you know, and I'm just trying. And so it's now time for me to open my mouth and say something. I thank God for that scripture that says, don't worry about what you're going to say when you stand up before people to speak. you put words in your mouth. And he did. I started talking about something that happened to me when I was 12 years old, which was the same age as Gabriel. And what I was sharing was something that fit him in his situation. And grandma and grandpa was recognizing what's going on. The whole bunch of them is weeping. They all go to the altar and we have a great time of prayer and a great victory and everything. And I'm standing there over there scratching my head. Why did I tell that story? It wasn't in my notes, that's for sure. Let the Holy Spirit use you, prompt you on the moment like that. Don't worry about it. I don't know what I'm going to say. Don't worry about it. Just open your mouth and let him fill it. Amen. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So once again, point two. Come and drink. You shall receive power. Let's go over to uh, Acts chapter 2. Jesus is talking about receiving the Holy Spirit when we read in there in John. Out of your innermost being flowing rivers of water, if you're thirsty, come and drink. You shall receive power. The two work together. Peter is talking about this in Acts chapter 2, and I'm looking particularly at verse 38. Um, you know, I, I battled all afternoon on uh, chapter 2. I wanted to just cover the whole chapter, and I thought that's not my assignment. But if looking at verse 38, and Peter said to them, repent. This is after he had preached Jesus to him. He said, repent. Let every one of you be baptized and uh, put into the name and character of Jesus, the name and character of Christ, for the remission of your sin, that you may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What did he tell them to do? Repent. Turn around. Let's do it different. Let's go the other way. Be baptized. Put into the character of Christ. Jesus, for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the, Holy, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He did not say when. There's no time frame. For the promise of the Holy Spirit is to you, your children, your grandchildren, your great-great-grandchildren, to those who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. How many of you know that there is nobody on this planet that God is not calling to salvation? Nobody is appointed to go to hell. Every living creature on this planet, God wants saved, born again, in his Father's house. Wow. And right now, there are those who have never heard the gospel. Tonight, and tomorrow, 
And the day after, and the day after, somebody will die, never having heard of Jesus. Jesus would not send that person to hell. Jesus will not send anybody to hell. Jesus will not send anybody to heaven. We choose. Amen? Written on the heart of every living being on this planet are the basic principles and characteristics of God. And a person who has never heard of Jesus, Father Abraham is one of those kind of people. He'd never heard of Yahweh. But he knew that that idol he was making was not God. He knew there had to be something. How did he know that? God put it in him. He put it in every single one of us. Do we know the difference between right and wrong? We know what's good and what's bad. From one culture to another culture, from one nation to another nation, it may vary, but the basis are there. And so I guess he's going to have Sunday school when those people get to heaven. But I do know this, that all those in the Old Testament died in the faith, but they were not saved. Everybody in Abraham's bosom died before the cross. Never heard of Jesus. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Daniel, Ezekiel, I can name them all. But when Jesus cried from the cross, it is finished. And they were wrapping his body up to put it in a a grave. Jesus, the Son of God, walked into hell covered with our iniquities. And as the demons reached out to grab hold of him, their hands slid off. I'm using my own little story here. Their hands slipped off because sin could not hold the righteousness of God. You and I have been made righteous. Sin cannot hold us. And so all the devils were left with with all the nasty, stinking things I had done in my lifetime. And Jesus came out of there, and on his way to present his blood before the throne of God, he stopped by a place called Paradise, the bosom of Abraham. And you know who was in the bosom of Abraham? There was a man that hung on the cross right next to Jesus. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked at him and said, well, you haven't been baptized and joined the church yet. No, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. I want you to know something. That day, I have to tell you this. Before six o'clock that evening, Jesus died on the cross, went to hell, got rid of our garbage, got rid of our junk, and got into paradise. Before six o'clock that evening, he had said, okay, now you guys that died in the faith, this is what you were believing for. And he presented himself to the Messiah. Abraham accepted him, and he's on his way to heaven. Isaac accepted him. Jacob accepted him. Daniel accepted him. Ezekiel accepted him. And the thief on the cross said, and me too? And he said, absolutely. Come on and let's go. Hallelujah. And they all went into the kingdom of God. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you. Now, to be fair... I'm not finished with this drinking business. Let me show you something. Letter B, under point two, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living waters. Therefore, you and I have got to learn to drink in the presence of God. Drinking water and being filled with water is something you do, not something the water does. Hello. Now, I'm thinking about Gideon. God called him to battle. He sends out a war cry and 10,000 gathered. 
And God said, uh-uh. If I let you win this battle with 10,000, you'll take credit for it. So send the fearful home. They almost all went home. Nobody in the church wants to fight. Nobody goes to church saying, I'm looking for a fight. Who can I fight? You know, we just don't do that. We walk out in the world and we try to put up our garden everywhere. We don't want to have to fight the devil out there. Come on, I'm going to tell you something. Paul said, get in his face and just go, ah, and he'll run. He's a coward. He has no power unless I give him mine. He's a defeated foe. Now, drinking water and being filled with water is something you do, not something the water does. And so Gideon winds up with this small crowd and God said, it's still too many. He said, take them down to the brook and have them drink. That's something they had to do. He said, now, those that get down on all fours and lap water Send them home. But those who get down like on one knee and take their hand and scoop the water and drink it, and keep an eye out just in case the enemy comes over the hill. They're watchful. Keep them. And we had a glorious army of 300. And God said, now, post them all around the valley. And give them a, a jug, a clay pot. And give them a torch. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to set that torch on fire. Now what? Stick it in the pot. Well, it uses up, what, uses up what little bit of oxygen is in there. It's just smoke. And I have a sermon on holy smoke. And when you give the word, everybody's supposed to shout. Can anyone tell me what they had to shout? The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Do you know how to drink in the Holy Spirit? You drink the Holy Spirit in by getting in the Word. And as you get the Word in you, the Holy Spirit has something he can work with. And I'm about to get happy here and shout a little bit. Woo! And so 300 watchful carefully doing what they were supposed to do, drink. That clay pot is you and me. The fire, and you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. That fire inside of you is just smoke until you let him out. And when you let the Holy Spirit out, you shall have power. And that power is going to heal the sick, bind up the brokenhearted, do all these wonderful things. Folks, some of us, are, we smell real good. we got holy smoke. But it's time for us to break this old carnal man down and let the fire of God out. So that the, and we say, the sword of the Lord and of Jim Hart and the sword of the Lord and Gary Morris, the sword of the Lord, Brenda, and you, every single one of us. We are the sword of the Lord. We take the sword and we go to work with it and the enemy is defeated they didn't kill one one they didn't kill one of the enemy the enemy destroyed themselves folk if we would just stand up and let God be God in our hearts in our homes and in our church I guarantee you the devil will go home and leave us alone and he won't come back God bless you have a good evening I am done for the night
Amen. Hallelujah. Lord, I want to be near you. Lord, I want to see your face. I want to be in your intimate mercy. Lord, I want to be like you. No one can be. Lord.